Right. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the last panel session of the day. Uh, Professor Lawrence Friedman uh, to follow. Uh, now, um, last time I, I did a, uh, an event uh, for the excellent UK and the changing Europe, it was on the day uh, that um, the Prime Minister had called the general election. Uh, and we had 45 minutes discussion uh, about that. Um, at which point a gentleman asked a question and said, what if the election's in November? Um, so let us just get it established that there is a general election which is happening uh, on the 4th of July to start. And, and uh, what we've done this afternoon is got a panel which more or less uh, reflects uh, the main parties uh, in this election, although none of them are candidates and none of them, I, I believe, are uh, currently directly associated with the campaigns. Uh, they are from furthest uh, from me, um, Baron Stuart Wood of Anfield, I think that's a football reference, uh, who uh, worked for uh, Gordon Brown and Ed Miliband, or worked with them. Uh, next to me, Polly McKenzie. Uh, that's Polly. Oh, Polly there, just there, yeah. Um, uh, of the uh, University of the Arts of London. Also, I've got to say this, since I uh, also have some association with it, uh, the star of Times Radio's How to Win an Election podcast. Uh, and she worked with Ed Davey and Nick Clegg. Uh, here is Rachel Wolfe, uh, who was one of the authors of the 2019 Conservative Manifesto, now works for Public First. And um, we've got uh, Rob Ford from Reform UK. No, actually. <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, Professor Robert Ford uh, of the University of Manchester <laughs> and, and UK, who's going to... Um, Keep political order. What we're going to do is talk about the future of the UK within the context, of course, in UK and changing Europe. And I just want to ask all of you, uh, not take anything for granted about the election, but we do know what the polls say and all the rest of it. How do you think the election is going to change the UK's relationship uh, with Europe? Stuart. Right. Oh, it's with Europe you want us to do? Yeah. First of all. Okay, well, it was very nice to be here. And as, as Adam said, I have um, no connection to the uh, campaign or the current uh, policy position, so I can speak a little bit more freely, but um, it won't surprise you to know I'm pretty supportive. Um, how, how will, if a Labour government comes in, how will, it, how will it affect the government's relation with Europe and Britain's relationship with Europe? Well, it feels that Labour has changed its position in the last couple of years. As we all know, for a long time, Labour was very, very, very timid, frightened perhaps, of talking about Europe. I think because they were worried that any time a front bench or even the leader of the opposition talked about Europe, they will be nailed by the Conservatives and others as part of a conspiracy to rejoin. And they were slightly put on the back foot by that. And, and there was a sense that you couldn't really talk about Europe in any constructive way at all. Strangely, the thing that changed that, in my view, was the, um, was the Windsor framework moment when Rishi Sunak kind of stared down the Brexiteers inside the, the Conservative Party and made the case for a more practical, pragmatic approach and won inside the government on that. And I think that released a space for Labour to actually talk about a more, a slightly more pragmatic, cooperative approach without it being uh, portrayed as a, as a sort of drawbridge across the, across the divide into a rejoining uh, campaign. And as a result of that, Labour has been a bit more pragmatic about and set out a lot more practical sort of uh, ambitions, as it were, for what it might do with Europe. And the second thing that's changed um, is that until a couple of years ago, well, until a year ago, the main vehicle that Labour thought about for changing the relationship with Europe, for making it a closer, more cooperative relationship, was the TCA review in 2025, six, when is it? Around then. Um, the review of the um, trade and cooperation agreement that, that came along with Brexit. That had a particular timetable, and that review moment was seen as the, the place when you could throw in Uncle Tom Cobbley and all, all the things that um, aren't quite right about our relationship, and you could show a little bit of value added and a more practical approach. It seems that that has been changed now, and instead we have a bespoke idea of a UK-EU defence summit, which, if you read between the lines, won't just be about defence. I think it's a relationship establishing bilateral moment, which actually will open the doors to other kinds of issues 
associated with defence, but perhaps over time going on beyond defence. And that seems to me, that more bespoke bilateral um, relationship, seems to me the cornerstone of how a Labour government would approach the EU. I think they, they are very happy to have conversations, to have structured conversations, even to have an ongoing dialogue leading up to regular summit moments. Uh, quite how much is going to change is an interesting question. Rachel Reeves the other day made a, uh, remarks about no one who voted for Brexit voted for a more distant relationship with the chemical sector and the finance sector. Um, they do have an approach, which some people have characterised as a bit like Theresa, May, Theresa May's approach to Brexit a few years ago, of looking at individual sectors, looking at individual issues like the problems that touring musicians have with visas and insurance and um, other particular issues and thinking that you can make progress incrementally in all of these things. Now, the politics of the trade-off on that is going to be very, is very interesting. And the problem of negotiating with a Europe that looks quite different to the Europe that was there three or four years ago is also going to be an interesting one. But I think you, are, you will definitely see attempts, at least, to have incremental change on particular briefs to do with um, particular sectors, mutual recognition of qualifications, some issues on visas, a cluster of issues. The, the, the really knotty issues, of course, are going to be to do with migration uh, and whether Labour um, talks to the EU about migration, particularly for some sectors where, you know, issues like care, for example, care sectors, um, and more fundamental issues of trade and trade relationships. Those are going to be the more, um, the more knotty issues. But I think in terms of the, the mood music and the mechanisms by which conversations happen, it will be quite different. Now, Rachel, yours was the Get Brexit Done um, referendum uh, manifesto. How do you think this election is going to change Britain's uh, relationships with Europe? I'm sure this has come up a lot earlier in the day, but I, think, I suppose the first fundamental point is it's not the same Europe, and it's going to become a more and more different Europe. And what you had at various points during the Brexit negotiations, which was a fairly united Europe, at least in some ways, who saw Britain as a sort of slightly odd and irritating aberration, has become an incredibly divided Europe, where it's plausible that right-wing populist parties will continue to do well at least for the next couple of years, and that might change who runs many of the most substantial countries in Europe. So um, I don't think you can think about the changing relationship with Europe as if Keir Starmer had been in power four years ago. I don't, I don't think that's the landscape that we're looking at. That's partly the scepticism that those people have about various issues. It's also about the issues themselves. Uh, immigration is one, defence and war is the other. We're now looking at a Europe that's credibly on the verge of war in all sorts of different ways, um, in a way that was not on the radar in 2019. So I, I think you can't ignore that, and I think it makes uh, changing the relationship in the way that people would have hoped for a few years ago very unlikely. I, I am sure there will be tweaks or attempts at tweaks usually in the kind of regulatory alignment space, uh, looking at things like the ETS and, and carbon trading, many of which might be marginally sensible. I would be astonished if any of those changes in the next couple of years were dramatic in terms of the UK's growth or migration. Uh, although Stuart may disagree with me. I think there is, though, a sort of... Um, interesting perhaps underlying question uh, which may come across a lot of the things we talk about in terms of the future of Britain in this next government which is is there a secret plan is there a radical hope for the EU just as there's a radical intent on tax and spending that the Labour Party simply doesn't want to talk about right now because they're in the middle of the election they don't want to damage their 20-point lead or is there no secret plan and they're going to be exactly as incrementalist as they are implying? Um, if it's the latter, not very much will change. If it's the former, um, I suspect they won't be successful on the EU, but they might be very successful on lots of other things. Thank you very much. Um, Polly. So, um, something very remarkable might happen at this general election. Uh, it still probably won't, but it's possible that the Conservatives will, you know, not even be the official opposition. Um, and I have always said that we will not rejoin the European Union. I mean, whether we will ever or not, but uh, we will not rejoin in, until the Conservative Party comes to its senses and starts to think that actually 
you know, in the interests of economic liberalism, that there is, it is worth being part of a trading partnership with your uh, neighbors. Um, because until the Conservative Party shifts, I think that Stuart is right, that Labour will sort of do as much as possible with Europe in partnership that cannot be criticized as reversing Brexit. But of course, what might happen uh, at this general election might change that idea because actually, you, again, you might end up with um, a cluster of opposition parties of re still relatively small sizes in the SNP, the Liberal Democrats, crucially have said that they want to rejoin the single market. And the Conservative Party might then be a sort of a small party which gets sucked into recruiting Nigel Farage and going in a very kind of uh, deeply Eurosceptic direction even further than, um, than it has at, at the moment. And, and I raise this mostly because my colleagues have said sensible things that are much more likely to happen. But we should open our minds to the fact that something much more drastic might happen um, uh, that might shift the kind of central political parameters that we've been operating under for really quite a very long time. And, and the fact that the Liberal Democrats who have pushed for rejoining the single market, who are the most, uh, the most European aligned party, I guess, I don't know, I haven't read the Green Manifesto because I couldn't really face it, but may, may, maybe they're even more pro-European. Um, and um, I've had this conversation three times now today, but I'm just going to say it again. But the question that is interesting to me is, what would the Liberal Democrats do if they did become, you know, again, they'd probably be like two seats larger, but nevertheless sort of technically the official opposition. Would they seek to attack Labour from the left, as they sort of mostly do at the moment and certainly did in the post-97 era, or would they seek the political space in the centre-right that would be opened up by the Conservatives going right? Um, and I think it's, again, it's very possible that Ed Davies' strategic choice would be to adopt a position from the centre-right. And, and there, the just basic economic logic of alignment with your trading partners um, and, and being able to adopt a sort of free market position is probably their, their best claim to both adopt a centre-right position and take the membership with them. Um, and so I... Uh, these are these were relatively unlikely scenarios, but I think that they are worth considering because um, it might change where we get to in 10 or 15 years. Now, Press Ford, you said an asteroid was heading towards the Conservative Party in the Observer a couple of weeks ago. Or maybe an asterisk. I remember when the Liberal Democrats polled an asterisk. <laughs> well, what, what do you think about the UK's relation with Europe after this election? Um, yes, th thank you, uh, Adam. I was quite, quite pleased with that. It's actually uh, Tony King's line originally from 1997, um, but I think it's a bigger asteroid this time than it was in 1997. I'm going to be a little bit uh, parochial and bring it back to, to sort of UK um, politics because that's kind of my specialty. And I think a couple of points that's worth making in terms of thinking about the UK's politics in the next 10 years and how we might orient towards Europe. I am going to assume that some sort of an asteroid happens. I was on a panel with you, Rachel, actually, where we were all asked what will the next election bring, and everyone was like, oh, maybe a small Labour majority. And I said, I'll push the boat out. I said, it'll be a big majority. So I'm going to claim... Well, I shouldn't claim my win too early, actually. We've got a couple of weeks to go. But let's assume it is a big Labour win. Then the Conservatives will face in opposition the same problem that Labour faced in opposition, but from the opposite end of the telescope. Morgan McSweeney's whole strategy in this election, in this parliament, has been we have to win in leave-leaning battlegrounds. So we have to lean leave. We have to be able to reconnect with voters that wanted Brexit to happen. But the sheer force of demography will ensure that that is not the way that you win in 2029 or in 2024. It is not the way you will renew as the Conservative Party. They will also now have to move out of their Brexit-era comfort zone and find a way to reopen conversations with Remainers. Now, they may choose not to do that. As Polly pointed out, they may choose to carry on talking to themselves and talking to Nigel Farage, but that is a route to irrelevance. Demography ensures that. The voters that you would win or that could deliver an election victory for you using that strategy won't be available. They will be joining the choir eternal. So you can't win an election with them. They're not can I, here. Can I ask you a question, Rob, because I'm really interested in your view on this. So in other countries in Europe, 
increasingly some of the kind of more immigration skeptical, more right wing people are young. Do you ever see that happening here? Yes, I do. Um, but I think one of the reasons we don't see that here in our organised party politics is the enormous turnout gap we get, which is partly due to our first pass the post electoral system. If you're a young, disaffected, nationalistic voter uh, in the Netherlands or in Germany, you can vote for uh, a radical right wing populist alternative and get radical right wing politicians in parliament. Here you can't. Uh, and older voters vote anyway, despite that constraint, whereas the younger voters respond by disengaging entirely. Uh, it, it is one of the potential risks that might come with a change in the electoral system is that it could then bring groups into um, the political conversation again who won't necessarily behave as we anticipate. So I think there is a seg segment of the British young, just like the young everywhere in Europe, who, who would be attracted by that kind of politics. Um, but I think on balance, when you look at the pattern of attitudes generationally, you know... The, the electorate of 2029 will be, on average, less socially conservative than the electorate of 2016 was. And that's the electorate the Conservatives will need to win with. And this will be even more true in the seats that they're losing, that they would expect to win back the seats where the Liberal Democrats are their main opposition and so on. So that's point number one. This is going to pull the political conversation in... Not a remain sort of direction in the sense of negotiations with Europe, but a remain direction in the sense of values and state of mind, yeah. as it were, will be a country that is more remain sympathetic in terms of our political conversation, because that's what the incentives point to, I think. Um, but the second point I would make is it really, really does depend how and how quickly the main opposition parties, as it probably will be after this election, respond to those incentives. Um, will the Conservatives continue to duke it out with Nigel Farage. If they do, it will stall everything to do with Europe because the Europeans know how our electoral system works and they will worry that any deal that's done painstakingly with the Starmer government could disappear because any majority is not safe in our volatile first-past-the-post system. And I think, well, what if one of these guys gets in and just rips the whole thing up? Whereas if they start moving in a more moderate direction, it will impact the conversations that Labour is able to have in Europe because this is about will it stick? And will it stick depends on what the other side does as well. But I think the third really important point here is what are the opportunity costs to talking about this versus talking about other things? Nothing is free in politics, and there's an enormously big in-tray for the next government. Any deal with the European Union, any shift in our current position with the European Union will take years to negotiate with more difficult and fractious partners who are likely to change halfway through, and with what payoff? If you're Labour, is that really the best place to invest scarce political capital with an impatient electorate that is saying, as if through a megaphone, what we want is change? You are, they are saying that growth is their aim and that there needs to be a better relationship with Europe to deliver that. Well, yes, they are saying that, but um, I imagine that that is a, an, an argument with several moving parts, which is not an easy one to make in a five-minute clip or a doorstep uh, appeal. People will want tangible results quickly, and Labour will have to decide what do we... I mean, obviously, in the long run, I, I agree with you, Adam, in the long run, something more ambitious is needed on that front if you want to deliver a growth agenda. But in the short run, you've got an electorate that said, everything's broken, we need stuff fixed, we need stuff fixed quickly. That has demonstrated in this Parliament that if they feel things are broken, they, they can... But they're not going to stick around necessarily. They can desert you. So I just wonder, the opportunity cost, I think, will weigh heavily here. This is a big, long negotiation process with an uncertain payoff. It seems to me that the incentives are probably to focus, at least for the first few years, on, on the domestic side of things because that's where it's more obvious, that's where you can deliver things that are more concrete and sellable to voters. We are, of course, going to take uh, questions both on, on Slido and also uh, in the hall in, in sort of... At 10, 15 minutes' time, so uh, please have those uh, set. Well, let, let's move on a little bit from Europe now to, to the other issues around. Um, I just want to, Rachel, what, what you feel about this discussion which Polly has stirred up about, you know, the most exciting thing that might happen after this election is radical realignment of the opposition. Depressed? <laughs> um, I think that... The population isn't going to fundamentally change in the next few years. And the population hasn't fundamentally changed getting in older. the last few years. It is getting older slowly. Um, but you're all living longer too. Uh, 
And because of that, while Rob may be right that there's a slow, inexorable move towards uh, more liberal views, there remains an enormous constituency in this country for fairly right-wing policies and politics on some dimensions and quite right-wing policies and politics on another. And if the Conservatives are incapable of filling that gap, then someone else will. I don't know if it will be the Liberal Democrats, but someone will fill that gap because there's a deep political demand for that gap. Well, you don't think the Conservatives will, will basically move to some sort of reconciliation with reform or reform-type views? I think, I think those are two very different questions. There are clearly some people who you could imagine winning the leadership of the Conservative Party who would be quite keen on a reconciliation formally with reform. I think that'd be a huge mistake, but it's possible. There is a subset of reform views that I think in any scenario the Conservative Party will continue. It is not likely that the next version of the Conservative Party is going to be pro-high immigration. It's just not going to happen. Um, it is possible they will be somewhat different in their language about it. It is very plausible there'll be a big civil war on the economic approach that is sensible, but I think there is zero chance of that. So, so that will happen. Um, and uh, I think it is very, very likely that they will spend a few years tearing each other apart. So, I mean, that, <clears throat> I suspect even if Labour does win with a decent majority, I suspect that the story that a lot of everyone's attention will be focused on in the next year is precisely what happens to the Conservative Party in opposition. And the question of whether the Conservatives co-op reform, in my view, that's not the right question, really, because it's only one person that really matters in reform, and that's Nigel Farage. I mean, that's, that's what reform is. And the question is whether Nigel Farage is co-opted into the Conservative Party um, rather than anything else. But if you're, if you're, you know, I'm obviously a Labour person, right, but if Labour wins, there is a ready-made narrative for, that I suspect the right, whether it's Farage right or Suella Bravman or Liz Truss or whoever right, Will, will use to attack a Labour government, right? They'll, every, everything that is wrong in Britain will suddenly be the sin of excessive tax, too big a state, uh, too much immigration, and trying to... Um, and weak internationalism. Or something, that's what they'll portray Labour as, as doing when Labour tries to rediscover its, our internationalist genes. Um, and that will be the narrative again and again that will be, will be thrown, thrown over the Labour Party. And the, the, for me, the interesting question is whether Farage is co-opted back into a Conservative Party, because everything else is as of a sideshow on that. But the narrative that the right, if, even if they're spending 24 hours a day taking seven, hitting seven bells out of each other, that's the narrative you will hear again and again about a Labour government, it seems to me. And they're building too many houses. Yeah, I, um, I want to disagree with that. I don't think we'll hear anything about the right it's knocking seven bells out of each other, because I think no, if the right are totally down to right. under 100 seats, no one's going to care. Mm, sure. I think there'll be an irrelevance. I think that the, the, within well, a year... Farage, Farage, Farage is going to get... Farage MP yeah, he's going to get three seats. I mean, party. if you look at the coverage well, and notice of this general election, it is noticeable how much time and attention is put on Nigel Farage absolutely. versus scrutiny of the party that will run this country for the next five years I mean, and what that, they're going to do. That's certainly true. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, that kind of... Uh, those kind of fireworks and rows uh, often um, gather a lot of attention in campaigns at the expense of scrutiny. The same, of course, was true with the fireworks in the Labour camp in earlier elections under Corbyn. So Farage will continue to be a soap opera. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm not disagreeing with that element of it. But I do think that when you move to a Labour government with a very large majority, and that's my kind of working hypothesis here. I mean, maybe it's different if the Tories are on 150, 200 seats. But, you know, there's no prospect of them having any power over anything. And I think the conversation goes where the power is. And I think the idea that a Labour Party that big will remain united very long is for the birds. I, I think There'll that's... be a soap opera in Labour, and that will be the yeah. soap opera everyone's following. And it, it will be about um, Angela Rayner, and it will be about, uh, you know, the factionalism that will emerge in yeah. the Labour Party. You know, that, and I think part of the reason... So we did have it early in the campaign for a few days around Diane Abbott, around Pfizer Shaheen, but... But it's because, I mean, it's because of our, our political coverage is obsessed with soap operas, not substance, and the right has one. But the most of what Labour is achieving is unity. And, right? and so from a soap opera level, they're boring. 
Uh, and that's why they're not getting much attention. The moment they're in government and there is a fight about, you know, some piece of NHS legislation that West Streeting wants to take through or some uh, budget thing or a rebellion uh, of, you know, 70 MPs, half their majority or something, on a tax measure. Like, or that, benefit. that yeah. will dominate, dominate political news. How much did we hear about Boris Johnson on manoeuvres as Mayor of London? Where we're going to hear an awful lot about Andy Burnham's on manoeuvres as Mayor of Manchester and what's he going to do? Is oh he going God. to come back to Parliament and all this kind of stuff? You know, it'll be the well, same soap for a different party. All, all right, sure. It's, it's all going to be about the Labour Party busting up in government. Well... There's definitely going to be there's definitely going to be different groups in the Labour Party. They'll definitely be. You speak as a brown knight. <laughs> you know, we're all Labour now, um, <laughs> uh, as, as Gordon's motto was. Um, <laughs> the uh, uh, yeah, there's definitely going to be different groups. I mean, I think on Europe it's an interesting case, right? Imagine imagine the next few years you get. I mean, who knows how it's going to go? But imagine if more and more business opinion. Uh, is moves towards the idea that we need a closer relationship with Europe. Imagine public opinion data shows that as other, you know, as generational change happens, more and more people want a closer relationship with Europe. You, you, that part of the Labour Party, I'm sure, will, will not not pushing for rejoin or all that, but pushing for a closer relationship with Europe. Uh, those sorts of public opinion changes will be mirrored in different parts of the Labour Party, of course. I mean, you'd expect that to happen, and that's that's definitely going to be part of it. Um, so yeah, and of course, at some point, of course, there'll be moments where there'll be fractiousness. I mean, that, that's definitely right. I just don't buy the idea that. I mean, look at the election coverage at the moment. It's just not true that, despite the numbers, that the rights will be of no interest. It's just, it's just not true. And, and the fact that we have such a volatile electorate and electoral system, which accommodates that volatility, means that actually there'll be a rationale for scrutiny. So I, 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 I don't agree with that part. Now, I've got one question uh, coming here on Slido. Um, could income growth for poor households be enough to stave off this mood of populism? What do you think? Uh, I think the short answer is, is no, um, because we've seen a number of countries in Europe that have experienced very strong income growth, including for poor households, and populist politics has continued to be robust, including amongst those groups. You see it also in the US right now, where... It's been the best three or four years ever um, for the bottom end of the income distribution in, in the US. Uh, are they giving any reward to Joe Biden for that? No. Are they going over to Donald Trump anyway? Yes. So I, I don't buy, and I, you know, I say this as a member of the car carry member of the political scientists union, I don't buy the idea that politics is, is you know, a branch office of economics. It's not. Um, so I don't think that these things feed through straightforwardly like that at all. Rachel? I agree, I suppose with a small caveat that it does seem to be the case that inflation, even if in real terms your income is outstripping it, has an unbelievably negative impact on people's perceptions, and that seems possibly what's going on in, in the US, for example. But no, there are clearly a set of issues. We played this out during Brexit. Um, there are questions in politics that are not just about how rich you are that determine how people vote and there are questions about how rich you are that have nothing to do with income can you get on the housing ladder do you think that your children will have in some sense an experience that is better than yours in in material terms which is not income terms so also no so, so yeah. in that sense so sort of rachel reeves is, is barking up the, the wrong tree if she thinks it's going to uh, help labor have two terms no, I think, well, I think you've got to be careful about, about pitching the restoration of the economy is, is your own definition of success for yourself. Because, I mean, look, the, the Remain campaign fell victim to that, right? The Remain campaign was a classic example of citing these aggregates and expecting everyone to feel the aggregate. But, of course, no one feels the aggregate about the number of jobs dependent on Europe and the level of growth. And actually, I found, I thought Rishi Sunak, who's supposed to have been... Well, he was a Brexiteer, and I would have thought he learned from the Brexit campaign, but he seemed to choose the election at a moment when inflation had come down to 2%-ish, and I thought, right, that's the moment. Because, and the idea that people go around saying, oh, I've noticed that um, the pint of beer in my local pub has gone up at a slower rate now than it was six months ago. I mean, it is the least, it's the least felt aggregate indicator, the rate of inflation, it seems to me. You just notice that it's much more expensive than it was four years ago. So all politicians make that mistake. But I think it's really important for any government, including the, hopefully the next Labour government, if it's going to make the economy so central, to get out there and establish w what they mean by a more successful economy in ways that actually match the felt experience. Because as 
Rachel and others have said, it's very easy to always point to something else and say, well, others are doing well, but we're not. And just going on aggregate growth, I mean, I, th I thought it was very interesting that Keir Starmer at the launch of the manifesto didn't just talk about growth, he talked about wealth creation. So the, I think they're, they're slight, starting to go down the ladder of aggregates to, human, to the human felt economy. And the question is, what's the raft of things at the human felt economy level that Labour is going to point to at the beginning of their time in office so that they can point to them later and say, these things have got better, we've consistently been pointed to these things. That's a very boring but very important part of what it is to govern the economy, it seems to me. You know, we, we remain stuck with all sorts of primarily demographic problems, right, and just in terms of the number of old people ratio to working age people, the pressure that that puts on working age people. Uh, I mean, our complete failure to build houses in this country during a period of unprecedented net migration is just fantastically stupid. Um, uh, and uh, again, partly because of that demographic pressure, but also because of you know, a sort of a range of other pressures, the experience of our public services has just been profoundly, profoundly harmed over the course of, you know, um, the last 15 years in particular. And, and there is a sense in which, of course, during the, um, during the global financial crisis and then during COVID, we, we literally got poorer. And there are distributional questions about who got poorer, but we, we're, we're poorer and that's painful. And we haven't really come to terms with that. We haven't come to terms with the fact that, we, despite all of that, we remain an incredibly rich country and that there are billions of people in the world uh, and that migration is getting easier. Uh, no matter how many gunboats you put in the channel, migration is getting easier and the constant pressure um, for the whole of the West will be people from poor countries wanting to move and climate change will make that worse and the pressures on our infrastructure, the pressures on reforming our... And these things are just massive. And we don't have a politics that ever talks about it. Um, and I think that unless and until we can find a way to actually have a successful conversation with people in their lives, at their level, in their communities, it, there will always be a space for populism because it, it comes with impossible promises. And, you know, who, who, who doesn't want the fantasy that, you know, the, 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 the reform manifesto, which we're just going to cut 70 billion out of public spending just by just doing it, and it's, everything's going to be better. And, and yet, people are seduced by that, and I, 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 don't, I don't really know how to fix it. I wish, I wish that I did. Rachel, are it, more houses the answer to the migration problem? I don't think it's the answer to why people are anti-migration. It's one reason why some people are anti-migration. But if you think about the people who are most anti-migration, they're not actually the people who are suffering most from high housing prices. Their children might be. So uh, let, let me, sorry, let me be really clear. It, it's, it's definitely true that bringing in vast numbers of people and not bring, building enough houses makes housing prices higher. So that is a problem. And if you want to stabilize house prices or reduce them, you're going to have to build a lot more and even more if you keep bringing in lots of people. That's obviously true. Is the reason people are anti-migration because of housing prices? No, I do not think that's why. I agree. <laughs> so, um, Rob, what, what do you think is going to happen on this migration question after the election? I mean, it is, assuming it's a Labour government, is uh, talking to France um, going to make it better? Well, I think that there's, um, from a Labour perspective, I think there's a, there's a glass half full and a glass half empty way to think about this. Um, the glass half full, full way to think about this is, number one, the Labour government that's likely to get elected in a, in a few weeks will be the first government ever of either party where the majority of the voters that elected it are actually pro-migration. That's never happened before um, because this country has, for a very long time, like most countries, been instinctively migration sceptical. Uh, at best, there's a grudging acceptance of it, not much enthusiasm. Now, I'm not saying that even a majority of the Labour electorate are massive migration enthusiasts. It's more that it's just not a big issue to them. And that's never been true before. So that's the class, class half full point number one. Point number two is net migration is going to fall because of trends that were already baked in and policies that have already been introduced in the past year. Uh, Keir Starmer's going to be able to claim a big win on migration thanks to Rishi Sunak's 
policies because there's a big lag between those policies coming in and them showing up in the statistics. And he will no doubt claim that win, even though it's really nothing to do with anything well, he's not going to do done. Rwanda, is he? He's not going to do Rwanda. No, that's, that's true. And that will remain a sore point. And that's the glass half empty side of it. So the half full side of it is the numbers will come down somewhat. He's got a less migration skeptical electorate to deal with. The glass half empty side is, firstly, there will remain a very large constituency of voters who don't like high migration. Uh, it's smaller than it was before, but it used to be basically three quarters of people, and now it's more like 40% to a half, which is still an awful lot of people. It's not a group you can afford to antagonize much. And problem number two is that they have very, very low trust in Labour's ability to deliver on this issue, which is where Rwanda becomes a problem, because Rwanda is really about rules and implementation and delivery. That's what it symbolizes and represents. It represents a failure to enforce the law, a failure to enforce the rules. People really hate that. Uh, and they hate it out of all sort of proportion to the numbers involved or the degree of suffering that has propelled those people across. Because what they want is a system that's orderly and rules-based and accountable. And this looks like none of those things. Yeah. So finding a solution to that is going to be really important. Uh, and that's where you crash up against the brick wall of, well, what is the solution? It's not really obvious that there is one. Uh, and so I, I do think... If I had to come down glass half or, or glass half empty, I think migration is going to be more of a problem than an opportunity for Labour because of that. Yes. So what are the issues that matter to the voters that are going to, as we all think, probably put Labour into power? Well, I mean, this is the thing, and this is historically unprecedented. On the Conservative side, issue number one for voters is migration. For Labour, it's like sixth or seventh after cost of living, NHS, public services, the economy, housing, climate... Right. So that's, that's your agenda right there, just, just a smooth, few small things to smooth out and then, then you're fine. <laughs> yeah, and, and on climate, Polly, I mean, we were hearing earlier about the European Union and that this has been mm -hmm. the Green the European Parliament and Commission, but Ursula von der Leyen and the others all seem to be moving in one direction. I mean, is, is net zero going to be further watered down, do you think, under the next government? I mean, no, I don't think so. I mean, the 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 economic logic of it, uh, in the longer term, is so clear that and 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 I think the Labour is strongly persuaded of the importance of uh, the investments um, that they want to see, particularly in order to unlock jobs, in particular in. Uh, those constituencies around the north in coastal areas that they want to unlock. And, you know, we've talked a bit about planning reform. You know, it's not just house building planning reform. It's also a bloody onshore wind. I mean, it is so ridiculous that this uh, um, technology that the UK climate was pretty much, like, purpose-built for, uh, we're unable to build onshore wind hardly at all it takes 10 years it's nuts right if you if you want quick gains for the economy actually lots of the kind of net zero transition activity really is there and if you can get back to the point where the uk is just slightly ahead and has potentially first mover advantage as we did sort of for a bit on on green cars it makes sense to attract foreign direct investment that way sure. as well yeah, I think Polly's, this is a really important point Polly's raised. See, Labour, Labour basically wins when it can own a story about building a better future. You might think at the moment one of the big reasons Labour's going to win is because lots of people are fed up with the 14, 14 years of, of the Tory I mean, government. that is also true. Which is also true. Um, but Labour, Labour has to have a kind of future story about why is it, what, what, you know, at Lee 45, Blair 97, all that. Wilson 64. Um, uh, actually, this is the best candidate for that, for this Labour. You know, yeah, except you buried the 28 billion. Well, actually, Labour had, it, Labour had its kind of rumble in the jungle moment about, about the green agenda before the election, right? But when, when they had to, when they watered down, whatever you think of it, they watered down. And the, but they, the price of that was they all came out, they came out with a very, I mean, Labour gets a lot of criticism for not setting out lots of its policies in detail. On this, you can read lots and lots of specifics, 7.3 billion National Wealth Fund with this much going to gigafactories. I mean, they really put lots of detail in it. That was partly the, the, what flowed out of the out of the discussion slash argument they had about what they should go into the election with as their platform. Now, I, but the, the important thing is the green agenda for Labour is it's, 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 they've, they've cleverly turned it into a story about growth, about jobs, about embracing new technology, about future, about infrastructure. So it's a business-facing message. It's not just a sort of liberal virtue signalling policy. It's much more than that now. So that's why I think it's much more robust 
than people think. That whether it, and as a, as a huge part of their constituency, as Rob said, that really cares about this. And if Labour's clever, they'll encourage it. They'll encourage their voters to care more and more about it, so put pressure on them to keep that high in the portfolio of issues that they, that they put to the front, I think. Okay, and Kate, okay, questions in just a moment, Rachel, on this green agenda. It's popular, and it's popular among most voter groups, including relatively conservative ones. Um, I think I would be worried if I were Labour about two things. The first is, as we were discussing earlier, is the planning reforms that they want to put in place to make it easier to build infrastructure, but also housing. I think it's going to be a monumental political round. If the Dems become the opposition, my God, will it be a monumental political round because they're very good at nimbyism. Uh, so I think we're, we're underestimating how hard that's going to be. The other is that some of the move and some of the economic gain, potential economic gain from moving uh, to net zero relies on the rich countries of this world, the US and Europe, being on board. And they're all going more, more and more uh, net zero skeptic right now. They're not on board in the same way. There are huge internal debates within America about the entire ESG agenda, whether that's going to continue. I'm not saying that will change things in the next two to three years, but could it plausibly change things in the next 10? Yes. Okay, any questions from the audience? Yeah, um, let's go gentlemen there, and then we'll go. Labour has promised an awful lot, and I think from the discussions today, my thoughts before, that it's not going to actually deliver on anything at all within six months, even probably a year. We're looking at the uh, troubles in Europe now as well, and I know you said that immigration will probably drop, but with what's going on in Greece, what's going on in France and Germany, that there's a risk, I think, that those immigrants could actually look at coming to the UK as a safer place. He's promised a lot, uh, and um, the, the, the what's, Labour what's the question? Yeah, Labour MPs and unions, and I think the voters will dislike Keir Starmer. In six months, could he lose the majority and lose his position within Labour, and there be another vote within Labour to replace him in six months? Because I know that some Labour people do want that, and I've talked about Labour MPs. I think uh, a, a six-month timetable for the departure of a leader who's just won a very large victory would be uh, quite... I mean, we've seen a lot of drama in British politics. That would probably take the cake. Um, you know, normally, there's a lot of death in a leader. Um, Theresa May stuck around a lot longer than people expected. So did Tony Blair, post-Iraq. Um, leaders have a lot of authority. Uh, Keir Starmer has also made the rules uh, more difficult to actually launch leadership challenges, and the process is quite complicated within Labour. So I dare say I would bet my mortgage against him disappearing within six months. However, on a different point, could Labour's poll lead fall very quickly once yeah. it gets into government? I think that is quite possible. And um, I think at the moment... The entire electorate is focused on a government that they're really eager to remove. There's a very strong time for a change mood out there. But that can dissipate very, very fast. It didn't in 97, um, but it did quite rapidly in 2010. Uh, the, the polls moved very fast, as the Lib Dems remember very well. Um, and I think we're, we're probably closer to 2010 in terms of voter volatility than 1997. So I don't think they'll get a long honeymoon. I'll tell you one thing, were Rishi Sunak to win the election, I think he'd face an almost immediate leadership challenge. But that point tells you more about the Conservative Party. Uh, Stuart, what do you think? No, I agree. Look, I think it's interesting. L Labour, I don't, I don't agree that Labour's promised lots of different things. I mean, there's lots of sort of what you might call mid-level policies. That, that, I mean, their method is, uh, we're not going to promise the earth. We have these specific tax tax increases, their down payments on, a, on reform, on, on reinvestment and of public services in particular, but we're going to need a decade to turn around the last 14 years, etc. That's, that's their method, right? whatever you think of it. Um, and so they're not promising the earth straight away. I mean, I think, there'll be, I think there'll be a budget early when there'll be three or four things which will be these, on, particularly on NHS, for example, and things like that. But I don't think there's going to be a... Uh, a sense that they've over-promised. 
Uh, but nevertheless, they'll be held to account for a country that isn't changing back quickly enough. I'm sure there'll be a little bit of that knocking around. I think you're, I think you're, you're, you're right about that. I think they're prepared for that. They know that the first year is going to be really tough. They know that there's going to be quite a tough spending review that they're going to have to do. And, they, and the, they, they're sort of you know, working out a strategy of the, the politics of that because I think people will want change quicker than the sort of more uh, longer term strategy that, they, than they, that they, have in, they have in mind, yeah. I think if we take the model from 97, um, if you've got a big majority, you don't run into trouble very quickly um, in your own party. Uh, the gentleman there, yeah. Uh, we haven't really mentioned uh, Scotland or Northern Ireland in this. In my view, there's also the North-South divide as well. Labour will have to deal with that. Labour will have to deal with the problems in Northern Ireland as well. So, right, okay. Do you want to say something about that? So what, what about the union, um, Stuart? Yeah, um, what about the union? I mean, um, it's, it's fascinating. Just... It, one of the interesting questions of this election is what's going to happen to the SNP Labour contest in Scotland? And your answer six months ago might be very different to now. I mean, who knows what's going to happen, but the SNP is obviously having problems. Um, and Labour could benefit from that, but we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, and that, that sets up a different dynamic if, if, if you have more Labour MPs in Scotland, but you still have a Scottish-run Holyrood, an uh, SNP, SNP run Holyrood. Um, that sets up a different dynamic. I think, I think there is an interesting question about Labour over the past, since Gordon Brown, Labour's been very quiet about the union as an issue. Um, and I think Keir Starmer has started to turn that around and wants to make a kind of social democratic case for the union. And he's just done a few things here and there so far. But I think that's an interesting question, whether he feels the need to do that whether that fits with his wider political strategy. And I suspect he will, actually. I think the union will be much more to the fore in a prime minister-led Labour argument, as it were, about, or Labour narrative about the country. Yeah, but, I mean, Rachel, um, Nigel Farage officially launched his campaign in Wales, didn't he? What, what do you think he's up to with the union? Uh, well, Wales in 2019 was quite important, and lots of Welsh constituencies did go... Conservative, so I don't think it's particularly surprising that he was there. In Wales, we usually treat completely differently from Scotland. There's no real prospect of independence of Wales, as far as I'm aware. Um, on Scotland, it seems to me of all the political problems that the next government is likely to face, I probably wouldn't put Scotland and the Union in the next few years very high up, precisely for the reasons that Stuart outlines uh, the SNP have imploded. If you all heard the like Starmer evil genie theory <laughs> that, that he has a genie locked in, locked in his house somewhere who's just making sure that all the stupidities and like bad decisions of other political players happen to make Starmer the luckiest general that there's ever been. And one of the things that the evil genie has unquestionably done is allow the SNP to murder itself with no intervention whatsoever from Labour, as well as all sorts of things that the Conservatives have done. So, so that doesn't seem to me an imminent big risk uh, for them. Um, Northern Ireland has never been politically bluntly that important. It's not the thing that determines elections in any way. And I, um, but it can drag Prime Minister's time and, and what any new Prime Minister discovers very quickly is that affairs that don't matter to the electorate are what drag your time and I, that's always a risk. I think it looks as if John Swinney has stabilised the SNP a bit in terms of electoral terms, but anyway. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, you and Grant, uh, United Kingdom Defence Forum. Um, most of my work as a former law enforcement intelligence analyst is on uh, the need for the wider democratic uh, law enforcement community to uh, fess up to the fact that nation states, hostile states, are now deeply involved in criminality with the sea, geopolitical criminality. My question is on um, the voting age. Labour have made comments about 
boats at 16, as of course is already in, in Scotland, my own nation. Um, how likely do you think that that would happen in the first parliament? What would its impact be? I don't agree with the comment made a few years ago by a former staff member of Nick Clegg. I think from when he was in Brussels, but it may have been Westminster, who argued that the, aid, the voting age should be dropped to 10. I, I don't okay. agree with that. Thank you. No, I, my, you Polly, was it? Yeah. Oh, no, I don't think the voting age should be dropped to 10. I, I think it, votes should be granted at birth. <laughs> uh, 10 is much too old, though I would allow the parents to vote on behalf of 10-year-olds until they were 10. Um, it's interesting, actually, because um, uh, I've said this before, I've said it multiple times, and every time um, whichever journalist is chairing the panel laughs at me, and it's all great fun. Um, but I, I said it on the radio, and it went viral, and people were laughing at me. Fine. I, I'm aware it's not an opinion that many people share. But I got... Uh, slagged off by Sargon of Akkad, <laughs> oh um, which is interesting because he actually is in favour of a pronatalist policy, which is to give parents additional votes for each of their children, which is, of course, the same policy. Um, and that just proves that taking a side in politics tends to rot the brain cells. But, uh, yeah, just to be clear... Anyway, sorry, what's the bit... Do you, are, you, are, you, are you saying that you would advocate that once children are 10, they they, can have their own they're vote. voting their own right. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, there's, there, there's lots of interesting kind of suggestions around this. Some are that actually the children should enfranchise themselves by, like, having to basically claim their vote from their parents. They should be entitled to do so after the age of 10. 10 is, of course, the age of criminal responsibility. So if we believe that at 10 you are able to understand the law enough that you can be punished for breaking right. it, it seems to me a reasonable threshold for suggesting that you might have a stake in uh, making But law. just to be clear, the Lib Dem but policy is 16 at the moment. Lib I, I, I'm not a member of the Lib Dems, and neither do I get to dictate what their policies are. No, but you are, did so. used to make their policies, so... And of course, that was made by a democratic process, Adam. And it, and um, it, was, and it was 16, yeah? It was 16, I'm yeah. pretty sure it still and it is. is. But okay. it's all right. Well, I'm right, they're wrong. Oh, I mean, my 11-year-old my, my son would be delighted about all of this. Uh, he, he doesn't get a vote around I'm the kitchen not, table fact, very often. <laughs> Sorry. Um, no, no, but um, uh, no. Uh, uh, I mean, I actually think it is, it is a, a very interesting um, argument about where, where the point should be, which we're kind of ducking by just sort of focusing on an arbitrary number. But you have to pick an arbitrary number somewhere. I'm going to just talk a little bit about the public opinion on all of this. Uh, I do find it kind of perpetually puzzling, and I'm, you know, my, 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 I don't share my colleague Philip Cowley's curmudgeonly opposition to the idea of votes at 16, but an awful lot of the public do. Uh, it, it, if you put a bunch of constitutional reforms before the public, lots of them are popular. This isn't one. Uh, it's, a, it's, in fact, the labour equivalent of national service in terms of its popularity. People don't like it. It's not a popular reform. Now, I don't think that matters much because, number one, it's not salient with people. They don't care that much. And number two, this isn't many voters. It won't have any kind of big impact on the state of our politics or on the balance of power or anything like this. But I do find it puzzling that it's something that Labour lead with so much, both because there are more important constitutional reforms I think they could do. For example, enfranchising four to five million people who have been living here and paying their taxes for 10 years or more and never got a vote. My mum, who came from the EU, from the Netherlands, in 1975, never got a vote in a general election, despite living here the rest of her life. She passed away without ever having one. Um, because there was no process for getting one that wasn't expensive and difficult. So enfranchise those people first, would be my view, and come back to votes at 16 another time. It's just a lower priority. Do both. Mm. Do, can I just make you can have them in scope in the same piece of legislation, so it would be relatively sure. easy to do both. Could I say one small point of information, that the last four prime ministers of our country have been selected by Conservative Party members, as you all know, where you, have to be where you can be 15 and be a member and vote. Right? So right. Conservative Party membership is 15 and over. So 15-year-olds have been able to vote for the British Prime Minister for the last four times. OK, uh, lady there. Thank you very much. Um, is that an endorsement party? All this, all this talk about 10-year-olds, etc. We do read, don't we, that the, the electorate tends to be predominantly... The people who go to the uh, polls or do their postal vote are presumed, uh, primarily the older generation. And we don't really hear the Labour Party talking very much at all about climate change and the environment, which, you know, apart from Ukraine, etc., really is the most important 
factor in all our lives now and for the future, would we not, would Labour not be uh, attracting a lot more votes if it were to advance a thoroughly green environmental policy more thoroughly than it is doing? I don't think they need any more votes, do they? I mean, how many more are there to attract? Stuart, <laughs> 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 sure, I mean, you did lay out quite a comprehensive green agenda. Yeah, I'm, with respect, I kind of disagree with that quite strongly. I, I, I think that... I mean, I'm, look, I'm a friend of Ed Miliband, so you can put this down to this, right? But I worked I work for him for five years. But um, as climate change secretary, I mean, Labour's flagship policy, I believe, Rob might correct me on this, but someone, I think Luke Trill from More in Common said that one of the, I think the only policy that is prompted, that, that, that gets a positive rating without being prompted in focus groups or in polling is Great British Energy, Labour's flagship sort of new state organization to subsidize and promote and provide um, sustainable energy. So you've got that, you've got the, well, the national Labour's wealth fund promises with all sorts of sustainable energy funding there. Um, again, part of the fallout of the, of the argument about 28 billion was a raft of policies actually, which I think are pretty strong. Now you may think they need to be more, but I don't think it's true that they're not to the fore. I actually think um, you, you may just want them to be more to the fore than they are, but they're actually pretty front and centre in terms of Labour's policy offers. Okay, I, I would, there. So, so I would just add to what yeah. Stuart says, that Labour does best when it sells radical ideas as boring ideas, not when it sells radical ideas as radical ideas. And I think one of the success of their messaging on this is making all of this sound very safe and acceptable to moderate voters for whom climate isn't as high on the agenda. Hmm. Hi there. Um, public trust in political parties and institutions seems to be like at an all-time low. Um, are we just going to be stuck in a state of, of a vicious cycle of perma dissatisfaction with whoever is in uh, government of whichever political stripe trying to put their program in action? Um, because surely that low trust is going to make it harder to satisfy the public. And the less that the, the is delivered or, or perceived to be delivered, the more the trust will continue to go down. It seems like a sort of vicious spiral downwards. Is there anything that you know, the panel could recommend to break us out of that vicious cycle if they do see it that way? R Rachel. I have... Uh, I mean, number one, don't make lots of promises and manifestos you have no intention of keeping. That feels like a good way of starting to improve public trust. Um, I also think that the extent to which we are a highly centralized state which promises it can deal with everything permanently undermines public trust. So I, I think those are both things that you can deal with. And, and actually, I think Labour's broad approach, which seems to me, pick some relatively small things that you're confident you can deliver and try and show progress fast if they can, is, is sensible. Um, but, coming back to what I said at the beginning, I also think we can be very parochial and, and we have to recognise that all countries that look like us are going through paroxysms right now. So that's probably not just about what our government's doing. That's about fundamental forces that are changing. And my guess is we've got quite a while before they work themselves through, hopefully not through a major world war. Holly. Um, as so often, I agree with Rachel. I um, don't agree with you on votes to 16. Or 10 or yeah. 0. Or zero. <laughs> That's all right, Rachel. Um, someday I will persuade you. Um, I, I mean, I, I, th I think the, the, both the decentralization question uh, and also, I guess, more, uh, more democratic innovation are important to break through the, 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 the tendency of all of our politics and all of our politicians to promise you know, magical thinking level solutions to problems. You know, as if you, uh, level up. I, I, I wrote a white paper, job's done. Well, actually, no, it's, it's, it's slow, it's patient, it's boring work. And there is only space in our political discourse, it seems, for promises that are about inputs. You know, how many nurses we'll have or, or possibly activities, how many, how many appointments we'll have. You know, the idea of what we're trying to achieve just never really gets a look in. And I think that's partly because the politicians are frightened of being able to deliver it. That's because they are operating at this incredibly high level over these hugely complex um, systems, particularly around public service delivery or around economic growth. Um, and we do have this tendency when, when, it, when the sort of political class believe that something is obviously the right thing to do, like, I don't know, road user pricing, 
but they, they get stuck and they either say, well, well, we can't do it because the voters hate it, or uh, we will do it, we'll just do it right at the beginning of an election, I hope everyone's sort of forgotten or forgiven us after five years. Um, and we've seen that across, you know, I don't know, pensions or tuition fees or, um, or social care, which we never get around to doing. And it seems to me that, again, we need to use democratic innovations like, um, and actually the, the Labour Party has started talking about this, which is really, really good, Tr try, uh, trying to actually involve the public in co-producing structural solutions to these things through citizens' assemblies, citizens' juries. Um, instead of what we have tended to do is like, let's, let's get an expert, let's get a peer in to just sort of figure out the solution. That's not how you build consent. Uh, with the public. So uh, I think we have to do that, those kinds of things. And then, I don't know, it'd be nice if politicians would mostly just tell the truth, including about one another, which is the thing they're worst at. Stuart, how do you restore trust? I th well, God knows how you restore trust. I think that, that, that I mean, look, I worked in number 10 when Gordon Brown was prime minister. Right? It was a torrid time, as, it, as you'll remember. Um, the thing that always strikes me is this weird thing about politics. In election campaigns, there's this entire fiction that somehow... Uh, the person who's about to become Prime Minister and their top team will have complete control over the agenda and what are you going to choose to do on day six and day... When you're in government, events, 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 you know, 95% of what you deal, deal with is not something you choose to do, but something you... In fact, good Prime Ministers are ones who somehow still create the room for the important in the midst of the urgent, right? But we have this idea, particularly in election campaigns, like, are you going to spend eight billion on, in year three or are you going to you know, put it into year two, as though somehow you have perfect foresight and perfect control. It's just not the way politics works. I'd like to see a politician, leaders, not just here, but elsewhere, actually bring the country with them through the toughness of their choices. And that is a really high-risk thing to do, right, because they could get parodied for always raising questions and not having answers. But, you know, setting expectations about how hard certain things are to sort out, trade-offs that are going to be involved, you know, those of you who want this... This is going to be part of the price to pay. Are we, are we as a country prepared to do that? It sounds very naive when you talk about it, but I'd like someone to try it at least to dispel the idea that that might be the way to restore some trust. Rob, I mean, when you see popularity of people like Boris Johnson or Nigel Farage, I mean, does trust matter? I, I think it does matter. Um, but I think um, we've also got a problem, which is we don't reward success. Our whole model of politics is built around negativity and punishment, and I think that reflects some basic biases in human nature. One of the most consistent findings in all of psychology is everyone, everywhere, at every age, thinks things are worse than they used to be. Everywhere. Nostalgia, the most powerful thing uh, in the human mind, it seems. Uh, also, everyone everywhere shares negative news more than positive news and reads negative news more than positive news and believes negative news more than positive news. And then we combine all of this and we're like, well, why do we trust our decision makers, those in power? Why do we think they're failing us constantly? All we read is negative and we always believe things are worse now than they used to be. It's a wonder we ever trust them at all, frankly. Uh, and often uh, it's a wonder that they ever make any uh, effort to to, to bring about positive change, given that the incentive structure is so heavily skewed against us ever rewarding them for bringing about positive change. So I think all of us should reflect on our own biases in terms of how that produces politicians like Boris Johnson and Nigel Farage, because really the electoral incentive structure should be throwing people like that up more often than it does. OK, our time is up, but um, I'm just going to end by asking you each to make a prediction about uh, the uh, 4th of July. Labour 200 seat majority. Um, uh, Liberal Democrats, the official opposition. <laughs> Reform gets some seats. Uh, hopefully Rishi Turnak resigning once he's lost the election. Right, there we have it. Thank you very much indeed, and thanks indeed to my panel.